The title of my su subject today is Our Most Pressing Need. Our Most Pressing What? Need. need. This is something that, although I may have preached many times, maybe earlier in my ministry, because uh, I felt that, uh, well, you know, this is what we're told, then that's what we're supposed to be preaching. Uh, it's different for me today. I really feel the need of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I do have to say that this, by far, for the past year or two, occupies the better part of my petitions to God, is for the Holy Spirit. I am glad that um, uh, we're, we're beginning to feel more and more, especially in our leadership, we feel this very much. Amen? And that's a good thing for the church. Amen? That we need the Holy Spirit, because only He can bring in a good balance, not only in our messages, but in our lives. Amen? in our discipleship and in the way that we teach and in the way that we give a good example to the church. So I'm always petitioning you to pray for us as the ministers of the church. Amen? Uh, our work is not easy. Amen? Amen? Our work is not easy, my friends. And can I just talk to you as friends? I like to do that sometimes. Because if I can't do that here, I don't know where else I can do this. Amen? <laughs> our work is not easy. And, 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 and let me tell you something. Uh, the enemy loves to attack the ministers of God. He loves to do that. If you think you're under attack in your homes, you know, I want you to imagine what happens in the lives of ministers. It's not an easy work, and I'm not here complaining at all. I'm done doing that. Amen? But the enemy loves because he knows that if he can de destroy our, our, our ministry, our effectiveness, he can reach to the, he can reach to the church. He can, he, can, he can cause the church to, to fall. And, and so that's something that he loves to do. He loves to attack our homes. He loves to attack our families. He loves to attack our children. He loves to do that. Try to get our attention out of the way. Amen? But I am determined not to be a fair weather Christian. Amen? I am determined not to be uh, led or guided by my emotions. Because they ebb and they flow sometimes. Amen? I want to be a Christian who is always sunny because Christ is in my heart. And I'm not sitting here bragging. I'm sitting here just telling you that that is my greatest need and that's what I petition God for. Amen? Uh, love to attack our children. I was just sharing with John the other day. Someone just said the other day, you know, didn't say that to me, but he said that of me. He said, you know, of me. He said, you know what, look, you know, this, is, it's this religion of yours, this church of yours, that's what causes your children to be like this. This is a person who doesn't go to church, someone who's uh, uh, related to me. And they said, well, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's because it's, uh, this religion of yours is wacko. Our children don't go through that. Our children are just fine. That really broke my heart, not for myself, for that person. Amen? I am not the first to observe. Uh, David observed it. And Job, actually, I, I think most succinctly, talks about it. He says, you know, he asked the question, why is it that the homes of those who are not believers are not troubled, you know? Everything just goes smoothly if you don't believe. Amen? David said the same thing, so I am in good company. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I, have, I have no doubt whatsoever that when the time is right, they will open the door and they'll walk in one by one. Those children will do that. Not because I simply have faith based on nothing, but based on the sure, eternal word of God. Amen. Not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Amen? Amen? I only worry about myself, that my emotions will not get me caught up. And, you know, because we creatures, you know, while we walk by faith, you know, we have this body of death we drag around. We have eyes that see, ears that hear. And these things sometimes cause us sometimes to just forget what God is doing. Amen? Amen. So I'm just confessing to you that, you know, I'm just of like passion just like anybody else. And sometimes, you know, it, 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 you know you, 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 you're pressured to give up and to, to despair. But we do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. I am here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, no matter what happens to you, don't give up. And you are not alone. Amen? Time's up for us to just pretend like oh, everything's fine and dandy. No, everything's not fine and dandy. We are in a battle. Amen? That's what we're in. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. Uh, and uh, the context here is the seven churches. I'm not going to be talking about the seven churches. But I want to talk about a period during the seven churches. 
And uh, in this period here, the church is Thyatira. There were seven of them, and the church period was Thyatira. Okay? This is the church period that corresponded with the pale horse of the seven seals. This is the seven churches. When you look at the seven seals, it's good to compare them with the seven churches. Seven churches compared with the seven seals. And if you do that, whether you're looking at a particular one, always look at the other. And you're going to see some, some, uh, something mentioned in one that is not mentioned in the other. And together, they give each other strength and you can see a better picture. Amen? There is not one verse of the scripture that tells the whole story. Amen? There's not one verse of scripture that tells the whole story. You need some other verses that talk about, the, address the same subject. And thus, we are unable to see a better picture. The church is Thyatira. This is a church of the Dark Ages. And we're told here that uh, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou allowest, that word suffer means allow, that woman Jezebel. That's a negative connotation right there, reference. That woman. You don't want to be called that man. Amen? But this is inspiration. That woman Jezebel, whom I call a prophetess, who calls herself a prophet prophetess, we're talking about the Roman church, of course, here. And God is telling us, inspiration is telling us that even though she calls herself a church, I don't refer to her as a church at all. God says, I don't see her as a church at all. Amen? You don't want to know how I see her? Go to Revelation 17. That's how I describe her. A whore. Okay? She calls herself a prophetess. And she, you suffer. Now, this, this message is addressed to Christians living in the dark ages. It is not addressed to the Roman church, but to Christians who live in the Dark Ages. I have somewhat, or a few things against thee, because thou allowest that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to do what? Two things. To teach and to do what? And seduce my servants. Let's just stop for a minute. What does that mean? Teaching, that's clear. Okay? These were Christians who allowed, who gave in, who compromised. You know the church before that? was a compromising period. And in compromising, they allowed, they allowed, they let, they gave permission to the Roman church to teach and to do something else, to seduce. I had to look that up. I like looking up words. And that word, seduce, is a Greek word meaning to, to cause to go astray, to lead away from the truth. That's what the Roman church did in the Dark Ages. They not only caused people to go astray, but they led people from the truth to error. God is saying, I have something against you because you allow that to happen. And my friends, I want to let you know that today, you and I have a choice whether to listen to God as he speaks to us in his word, or to listen to the devil when he speaks to us through our emotions. When you allow yourself to listen to him and to give up and to do that, you are actually committing treason because you belong to God. Amen? Amen. You belong to God. You don't belong to yourself. And, and I have read somewhere in, uh, I think it's in the great controversy, that the crime that every uh, a lost person will be charged with is high treason against the government of heaven. That is a universal crime that everyone who loses on eternal life will be charged. High treason against the government of heaven. What is treason? What is treason? When you commit treason, who are you working for? A, a what? The enemy, another government. We are bought with a price. We have no business listening to the devil or his suggestions. Our marching orders come from heaven. Amen. Amen? And whether we feel good or we feel bad, we do what the Holy Spirit says. He says, and your ears shall hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right side and when you turn to the left. Amen? So when God speaks and he tells you something and the whole picture is not clear, well, just do what you understand. And then he will speak and tell you what to do next. Amen? So we don't want to do that now. So they, they, you allow this woman to seduce you, to, to, to turn you from the truth. 
and to commit my and to teach my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, concerning the Roman church, verse 21, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she did not repent. Now, don't ever forget that. Even though Babylon will be picked up, and as Jeremiah tells us, like a big stone mill cast into the ocean, and it will be destroyed, it is, be, it is not because God has not given them time to repent. They have been given a time to repent. And now the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul assigns to them that word, uh, that phrase, the son of perdition. They are beyond return. Amen? Now, so in your prayers, don't waste too much time praying for the Pope. <laughs> the Bible says he's a son of a perdition. Amen? They understand what they're doing. Amen? So this was a time of the dark ages. It, it's, it's a, it was a terrible time. Now, let's go to the book I said you need to compare them. So let's just go to the book of um, uh, Revelation chapter 6. Go there with me real quickly. Revelation 6. Are we there? Just a couple of pages there. And I want you to zero in on um, verse 9. Are we there? Uh, no, uh, no, not verse 9, but uh, verse, uh, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of what beast? What number? Fourth beast. Say what? Come and see. And I looked and behold, what color horse? A pale horse. Now that pale is, if you've ever seen a plant in a room, when it turns yellow and it's dying, that's that, that's that reference right there. It's a picture of a dead church. Okay? Now, uh, a pale horse. Now, now notice. Now, I want you to go back and look at um, uh, verse 5. Verse 5, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come in, see, and I beheld, and lo, what color? Black. A black horse. So black horse, that was a period of compromise. We know that. When you compromise on your religion, you're not on your way to enlightenment. The next horse is pale. When you compromise, your faith dies. Amen? That's what happens. It dies. Now, um, so, uh, going back again to verse 8, uh, it says here, A pale horse and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them to, over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, this was this dark period, dark ages. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you a little interesting facts about the dark ages. Um, this was a period that happened uh, immediately following the fall of the Western, or what is known as the Western Roman Empire. Uh, it was a period that, was a, that is described as a period of chaos. Uh, there was no strong central government to maintain order, and so things just dissipated. Um, the Roman roads and water distribution just decayed. Roman roads, why? Uh, well, uh, travel became very dangerous. There was no trade. It diminished. And so, the next thing you know, uh, all the trade used, uh, uh, trade routes were unused, mostly. Farming and mining completely ceased during the Dark Ages. Birth rates dropped. Disease and infections pretty much decimated the undernourished both animal and human population. It was, it was a bad time. Uh, the Western art and culture became completely, virtually non-existent except for what was protected by the monks. Is that a surprise? Uh, monasteries became the only remaining places of learning. If you wanted to learn anything, you got to go to a monastery. This, of course, gave the Roman church unlimited and unrestrained power to extend a doctrine because if you wanted to learn guess what you could only learn from them the Bible of course was, became outlawed and this is really what gave that period the title dark ages because God's Word being a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that became extinguished and when you remove the Word of God from the populace uh, even the secular uh, uh, realm is affected there were virtually no discoveries or inventions in the Dark Ages. A period over 1,000 years where nothing was invented. It was an interesting time. 
And when you go back to the time of compromise here, the black horse period, in verse 6, we read, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of what kind of grain? Wheat for a? And a three measures of what other grain? Barley for how much? And do not hurt the oil and the wine. Now, I read this in history that barley and rye were common. This is history, secular history. But wheat was uncommon because the manure, the high amount of manure that is necessary to grow it, that people could not afford. Now, what's manure? How bad was it that people couldn't afford that? That's bad. You know, it was bad. Keep it real. Okay? Now, it was even worse when the wheat ran out before the harvest. Because then what happened is that now it, it, things became even worse. People resorted to using the old rye and the barley. And when barley and rye is old, uh, it became infected sometimes with something called ergot. It's a fungus that causes hallucinations and death. Oh boy. There was a saying that rye will get you high and then you die. <laughs> this was a bad time. The dark ages was a bad time. Amen? This was bad. Things weren't growing. I told you, farming became non-existent. So what better illustration for the Holy Spirit to use, inspiration to use, than just that things were really, really, really bad. Now you notice it says um, uh, in verse 6, do not hurt the oil and the wine. Don't hurt the oil and the... Now, you notice that they've mentioned wheat. Wheat is what you use to make bread, of course. Now, of course, this is high symbolic language in the book of Revelation. The barley and the wheat is what people use to make bread. And bread is a symbol of the word of God. And the dark ages were dark because the word of God was confiscated by the Roman church. But don't touch the oil. And the wine, and the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And we know that the wine is a symbol of the blood of... That's how people get saved. How can people get saved without the word of God? Except for the world and saved, let me tell you. We would not have the word that we have it to, as we have it today. Except for the world and saved, Martin Luther and John Wycliffe and uh, uh, John, the Wesleys, uh, Charles and John they would never have been able to do their work because there would have been no Bible for them to preach. It's the Waldenses that bravely held on and protected the Word of God during the Dark Ages. And of course, they lived in the mountains, in the fastnesses, out there in the wilderness. They were hiding. Uh, as far as society, it was dark, as dark can be. I, I want us to quickly go to the book of Joel. Now that I've said that, I've painted that picture in your minds, I want us to go there. I want to show you something. Now, the Holy Spirit, of course, anticipates uh, all of this. God is perfect in knowledge. He sees everything. God does not wait to read the newspaper or watch television. Okay? And there's some of us who, are, who sit here in their lives, and we think that God is sitting up there in heaven going, oh, Wow, what just happened? No, he's very calm. In fact, uh, Ellen White describes it, 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 it I, I believe it's a, uh, it's a book, uh, uh, um, uh, what is the book that is written for the youth called? Yeah. Messages to Young People, <laughs> that's right. Uh, this is how she puts it, above the distractions of the earth, God sits enthroned. All things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees best. Is that comforting? Above the distractions of the earth, he sits enthroned. All things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees best. He is perfect in knowledge. He is not shocked by anything. He sees everything before it happens. Amen? So he had seen all of this. Go to the book of Joel. Whenever you look at Joel chapter 1, this is a sad, sad chapter. And you're looking at it. 
the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm has left, the locust has eaten. That which the locust has left, has the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm has eaten, has the caterpillar eaten. Uh, verse 6, for a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the cheek teeth of a great lion. In prophecy, what does lion represent? You said Roman culture? You said Judah? Okay, well, that's a good, well, but this is, this is a destroying lion here. Okay? Okay, we know that the devil is a lion as well, okay? What kingdom is depicted? Babylon. Babylon. Someone said Babylon. That's right, it's Babylon. Babylon was the lion. Remember Daniel? Four beasts, okay? Lion. Okay? It says a nation having the a teeth of a lion and the cheek teeth of a great lion. Now, Babylon, we know that there is a literal Babylon, but we also know that there is a spiritual Babylon. Who is spiritual Babylon? It's the papacy. That's right. It's a papacy. Okay? Now, so, but we know that by comparing literal Babylon and spiritual Babylon to uh, a spiritual Babylon, by studying literal Babylon, you better understand, we better understand the, how the methods and the work and the way and the methodology that the Roman church uses because they're really one and the same. Amen? In fact, do yourself a favor one of these days. Just go and compare Revelation 17 and 18 to the book of Jeremiah chapter 50, 50 and 51. Same language is used. Jeremiah 50 and 51 and, and, and the book of uh, 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 Revelation chapter 17 and 18, you will notice the, diff the same language being used. It's amazing. Babylon falls in, the, in, in Revelation 18. Babylon falls. Again, in the, in the book of Jeremiah. Amen? So you see that. It's very, very interesting. Now here, we're told that he has barked my vine waste uh, and barked my fig tree and has made it clean and bare and has cast it away and the branches thereof are made white. Now, when you go on reading Joel chapter 1, things are really bad. This is the picture of a destitute land, wasted, there's nothing growing because there's some kind of a famine, something has happened here that all of these things are, are happening, the vine tree is dried, the field is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the harvest of the field is perished, verse 12, the vine is dried up, okay, the palm tree, the pomegranate, the apple tree, all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered from the sons of men, things are bad in Joel chapter 1. So what's going on here? What is happening in Joel chapter 2? Now, of course, now, uh, we know now this. How many of you study your Sabbath school, by the way? Let me see. People, are you studying your Sabbath school? Okay. Okay. You, I don't know that, uh, especially when you start off, if you're not studying your Sabbath school and you don't make it a habit to do that, I don't know that it's possible to have a good foundation, John. Am I, am I, am I talking the truth? You really can't have a good foundation as an Adventist Christian if you're not really studying your Sabbath school. I have heard it said, and I believe this, because I, I, I studied the Sabbath school for many, many years of my life. But um, there is, when you hold the Sabbath school in your hand and you're studying it and you understand it, you have knowledge at your command that most theo theological ministers and experts do not have out there. As a common person sitting in the pews as an Adventist when you study your Sabbath school lesson as you should. Amen? It's very powerful. It's because it's it invites you just to go out there and, and you know, you, uh, study and, and pulling text together. And, and man, when you're sitting there, uh, you know, you're pretty much just like a, 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 a more than a common minister out there in the Sunday church is studying. There's a lot of wealth of information in these uh, quarterlies. You need to get to study them. 
And if you've been studying this particular one that we started right here, you already know that there are how many types of prophecies are there? Who can tell me how many types of prophecies there are there? There are two types of prophecies. There's classic or classical, and there is apocalyptic. There you go, somebody's studying that. There is classical and there is apocalyptic. Okay? Uh, apocalyptic uh, prophecy can also, you know, you can also call it eschatological prophecy. That means it's a study of last things, study of things that are going to happen in the last days. Now, and with apocalyptic or eschatological prophecy, it is not dependent on human response. Whether or not you believe it, it'll happen. You get it? But with classical, it's dependent upon your response. We see a lot of that when Jeremiah and uh, Ezekiel are writing to the people and all that, and they're telling them, okay, you need to do this and all that. And people studying this, not understanding, sometimes thinks the Bible uh, sometimes is contradictory. It says some things that don't come to pass. No, when God predicts something or sends a, a, a prophet with a message saying, no, if you do X, Y, Z, then this is going to happen, and you don't respond, then you don't get what God promised. You can't say that it failed. You failed. Amen? But the book of Joel is not a classical prophecy. It is a, an apocalyptic or eschatological. This belongs in the last days. It belongs along with, right there with Revelation in the book of Daniel. It talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the latter reign. Amen? Amen? And so it belongs to us. This is our book to study and to understand. Amen? And so when you read Joel chapter 1 and you see all of these things happening, this is really symbolic language describing the church of God in the last days. It is not looking good. In the words spoken to Laodicea, we think or we say to ourselves, we are rich and increased with goods and we, we do not understand that we are wretched, poor, miserable, blind and Naked, we have nothing. God says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, because you're poor. Things are bad right before the Holy Spirit is poured out in God's church. And so that's why we find ourselves, even in general conference sessions, we are debating things about ourselves. The things that occupy our, 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 our most pressing, uh, 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 you know, uh, discussions are uh, whether women should uh, uh, preach or how we should regard homosexuality in the world today. Those are the things we're debating today. And I'm here to tell you that there are churches out there that are looking at us going, what has happened to them? What's wrong with them? We, we, we thought they were, we, we, what's wrong with them? Things are bad right before the Holy Spirit is poured out. We're asleep. Remember the ten virgins? Mm -hmm. How many were sleeping? Just, just, the, just, just, the, just the foolish? Everybody is sleeping. And there is a need to awake. Now my friends, we don't have to. Now remember now, uh, part of that prophecy is classical. It's dependent on our response. Does it mean that we always have to be sleeping? Oh, you know what, does, does, does it mean that we, no, sometimes we believe we're Laodicea so much we even preach it, it's almost like unbeknownst to us, like we're proud of it. I don't, I don't see anything to be proud of about being a Laodicea. Amen? Nothing good about being lukewarm. And I am here to tell us this morning that you can determine that I am not going to be lukewarm. We were just talking about today in Sabbath school that, um, you know, uh, the teacher asked a question. Was, uh, we know that, um, uh, you know, uh, the, Judah was taken to Babylon, right? Was Israel sent to Babylon? Okay, I'm going to encourage you all to respond. Was Judah sent to Babylon? Yes. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, why were they sent to Babylon? It's because they were idolatry. They were worshiping idols. Is that true? Okay. Was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego idol worshippers? No. What were they doing in Babylon? Isn't that interesting? Because the righteous suffer along with the un unrighteous. Okay? But it doesn't mean because they were all universally 
labeled as idol worshippers that every single person was an idol worshipper. They were true Christians, faithful Christians in Babylon. And just because we are called Laodicea doesn't mean necessarily mean that every single person is lukewarm. So let me ask you a question. What is your choice? Do you want to be lukewarm or do you want to be warm and hot for God? That's what I want to be. Amen? And I'm here to tell you that even if this whole church became warm, uh, we're still Laodicea because there are 20 million strong Adventists and just... Um, 60 people are not going to make change the, the designation. Amen? But I, I'm going to encourage you to be a person who doesn't look at yourself as Laodicea. Because all you have to do is open the door and Christ will come in and stop with you and you with him. Amen. If you have done that, you're not Laodicea. Amen? You're not Laodicea. You know, back home, you know, we give names. Um, I don't know how you, some of you guys do in your cultures, but uh, back in our culture, um, when you have a son, the first son, like my son Chris, I named him after my dad. That's just what we do in our culture. Your first son is named after the father's the father. When you have a girl, the next girl is after the father's mother. If you have another son, after the mother's father. If you have two boys and two girls, you have both parents, both sides. Am I right? Now, if you happen to have more than that, and for I, I am a, come from a family of seven, of us, then the third boy, that's me, okay, now goes back to the father's first brother, eldest brother. And that's who I'm named after. Okay, if you have a girl, that's Catherine. No, Catherine is, uh, no, Catherine, you're my grandmother. So there's two girls, two girls, two boys. So in that sense, she's my grandmother because she's my mother's father. She's the second girl. My mother's mother. Okay? Now, so everybody else gets named after the brothers, sisters going down, and so that's how names are carried on. You get it? That's how names are carried on. And it is such a powerful, let me tell you something, you believe these things that when you're named, the way that we name, we actually take on the traits of the people we're, we're, we're named. It's incredible. Have you thought about that? You sometimes carry the traits of the people that you're named by. I don't know if you've noticed that in your, in your side of the family, but it's, it's the case in my family. Okay? But let me tell you a secret. I, I, uh, the person that I'm named, this is the one thing that I don't have from him, is an incredibly funny person. Okay? Very funny person, okay? Now, um, loves history a lot. I don't, I'm not like him in that way. <laughs> okay, now, but... Um, how do I say this? But he's also a very immature person. I noticed that when I was a little boy. And as soon as I could, I dropped his name. My name is supposed to be George Edwin Wamba. But the name Edwin, which is what he's known as more, you won't find it anywhere today. As soon as I could get, I lost my birth certificate. When I went to get another one, I wisely told them to omit that name. <laughs> and I, I, for whatever reason, I said, man, I don't want to be like him. I, he carries grudges. He gets angry all the time and all of that. I don't want any of that. I, I wasn't even a Christian. But there's something that I didn't like about that. So I said, I don't want that. I never told my parents. If they watch, ever watch this, now they're going to find out. <laughs> okay? But I didn't. He's dead. <laughs> I can talk about it, okay? Now, <laughs> I'm talking about what you choose to become. Amen? You don't have to necessarily be what people look at you. You can choose what you want to be. And you know, the good thing about being a Christian, God says, I'll give you a new name. <coughs> Amen? Unless you're terribly proud of your character and who you are, I'm not. I want a new name. Amen? That's what I want. So this is what you're seeing here. It's a picture of a church that is languid. It's dead. It's not flourishing. And so when you go to chapter 2, go there with me. Go there with me real quickly. I'm just going to give you an overview of this. I'm not going to go into the details and all of that. Okay. Uh, in view of chapter 1, chapter 2 opens up with blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm. This is not a good thing. Amen. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is, what? Nice. 
coming. So you see, the setting of the book of Joel is a time right before the Lord comes. Okay? Now go to verse 12. In verse 12, you see that first word? What is it? Therefore. therefore. Okay, that word therefore right there is inviting us to consider what was just said before. Right? And because of what was just said before, it says, therefore, also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to who? Me. Me with how much of your heart? All of your heart, and with what? And what with what else? Maybe. And what else? Morning. What are you mourning about? The Bible says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. But that mourning is not mourning for the dead. It is the kind of mourning where you mourn over your own condition. There are very few people who do that. Mourn over your condition, you will be comforted. If you go back and read the book of Isaiah, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, that's a reference to Jesus. And he read those words in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle, in the church, in, in Luke chapter 4. You remember that, 4.16, he says, he came to the church. We read that, we like to quote that. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read, right? And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. It goes on and on to say that. And when he had opened it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. He goes on and on and on and on to comfort those that mourn. The Holy Spirit only comforts you when you get to the point where you don't like who you are. When you become aware of your own sinfulness. And when you realize that you can't do anything for yourself because of that condition. When you go to God and you fall to him before him, you know what, when you're in this condition, you don't have time to fight with other people in the church. No. You don't have time to criticize others. You don't have to start, uh, time to say, well, you know, I don't like the way so-and-so is because you don't like the way you're so busy caught up in the way that you are. And the Bible says you will be comforted. Okay? Now it says here, so turn to me with all your heart, with, all your, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. But what has he promised? Those who mourn will be comforted. Notice, and rend your, instead of your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious. Notice the, notice the assurance. If you do this, you will find yourself falling before a merciful, a gracious God who is slow to anger and of great kindness and repents of himself of the evil. So when God says, I'm going to do such and such to you, man, there is enough evidence in the Bible that God can be angry and you can turn away his wrath. Isn't there? You remember even the very worst king in all the Bible is Ahab. Man, you know what he says, I'm going to go destroy him. And then Ahab humbled himself after all that he had done. And God says, how am I supposed to destroy him when he humbles himself like that? That's exactly what God says. I, I was going to destroy him, but now when he humbles himself, I, I can't do it. That's who God is. He is a good God. Are you glad God is like that? Amen. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you like that? Are you gracious? Are you quick to forgive others? The Bible says, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With the righteous, you will show yourself righteous. Amen? But with the forward or the wicked, you will show yourself what? God will come as, just like, let me tell you, that's, this is the reason why a lot of people see God, some people see God as harsh. You know why? Because they are harsh. That's what the Bible declares. God comes to you and when you look at him, the way you see God is because of the way that you have allowed yourself to be. With the righteous, you will appear as righteous. With the wicked, you appear as wicked. Wow! Did you know that you had such power? Yeah. If you're merciful, God will be merciful to you. If you're not merciful and God doesn't show you mercy, and you're sitting there thinking, well, how come it's not merciful? Well, it's because you're not. What do you think? If you're not showing others mercy, why would he show you mercy? Amen? And so here he says, read your heart. He says, when you do this, what's going to happen? Now, so we, this is a call to prayer because of the way that the church is, obviously. Amen? What, is, what does God do? Go to verse 23. This is what he answers. He says, be glad then, you children of Zion. That word Zion, by the way, is the word for remnant today. Okay? And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain. How? Wow. What form, when was the former rain? What? Pentecost was moderate? 
that was moderate. God said, oh, that's, that's just moderate. When they raised the dead, and Peter and John said to a man, we don't have any money, but get up in the name of Jesus. And he walked. That was moderate. When Peter went up to Dorcas, who was dead, he says, arise. Moderate. Amen? When, when, when Paul and Silas are in that Philippian jail, and, and they're praying, and they're singing, and the earthquake comes, and the doors open, and the chains fall, not just theirs, but every prisoner, moderate. 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 Now, notice what he says, but he says what? And he will cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. We are told that the latter rain will be more abundant. If you doubt this, go to the book of Hebrews all the way to the end in chapter 11, that great hall of fame chapter. He says, you know what? They, these all died not having received the promise, God having something better for us, that they without us should not receive the promise. Do we have a work to do? Yes. It is the most important work ever committed to mortals anywhere. Amen. Anywhere. Ours is to prepare a people for the coming of the King of Kings. This is not like, oh, you know what? Babylon is going to be taken over by Medo-Persia and their culture is going to continue. Their military might be taken away. Their culture continues. And then, you know, uh, uh, Medo-Persia taken over by the Greeks, you know. The Medo-Persian culture continues on even though their military might is taken away. And then the Romans take over the Greeks. The military might of the Greeks is taken away by the Romans, but the culture continues to go on and on and on. When the stone comes from heaven and smites the feet, no culture goes on and on and on and on and on and on. All the cultures and all the military mights of the world, everything comes to an end. And the kingdom of Christ alone will permeate the whole earth. Amen? Amen? Our job is to prepare the world for the coming of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is going to require a power that we don't have today. It is going to require a faith that you and I don't have today. It's going to require a courage I don't have today, but that I need. Amen? But the Bible says that, you know what, there are too many people who are languid and lazy, and we're not asking for the faith that we need. Amen? The faith that we need, and when the time comes for trouble to come, it will be then too late. And we will compromise. He says, I will give you the latter rain. And notice what it says now, the result of the latter rain. The floor shall be full of what? What grain is mentioned? Wheat. And the vats shall overflow with what? Both wine and what? Do you remember a time when there was no wheat? A time when there was no wine and oil? If you've been following the sermon, you know when that was. Okay? The Roman Catholic Church started that. Amen? And now it got to the point where, according to Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, the whole world is drunk with the wine of a fornication. That's the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And those teachings leave the church looking like Joel chapter 2. Remember, it's the lion, Babylon. That's caused all this to happen. Are you following me? But if we cry to God, he will answer. He'll pour out his Holy Spirit. What's going to be the result? Notice what it says here. Verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord, that your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am I'm in the midst of what? Israel. What does it say in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 2? Jesus is clothed the garment down to the feet and he is walking among the candlesticks. Do you see him there? I am in the midst of you. I'm in the midst of you. What's his job? Well, if you want to know what his job is, go back to the book of Leviticus and find out what, what is he doing among the candlesticks. Well, uh, he had ordered the children of Israel to bring in the book of Leviticus to bring the oil, olive oil, pure beaten olive oil to, for the lamps. And it was the work of Aaron, the high priest, who represents Jesus, to go in and he would order the lamps both morning and evening so that they would keep burning. The work of Aaron was to make sure that the wicks 
were there, they were long enough that they were trimmed and burning, and his work was to add the oil to the uh, uh, lampstands or to the candlesticks to keep them burning. That's the work of Jesus. He's walking in among us, and he's looking at you, D. He says, let me see what the level is in your oil. I want to give you some. But he doesn't just add it. He just sits there and waits for you to feel hunger for it. Because he says, if you thirst, and you hunger, you will be filled. That's right. Okay? But you've got to feel that hunger. You've got to feel that thirst. I'll tell you a real good way to make sure that you're always feeling it. If you're always ministering to others, you will feel it. <laughs> Nothing causes that when you're ministering, but you're like, oh my goodness, Lord, help me. I need to be able to know what to tell the people. I need the power, even after you know. It's not enough to just know the Bible, guys. I'm telling you, it's not enough. You can know it, and it can, you can teach and teach it well, and it wouldn't touch people. <coughs> it might give you a name. Right? You might have a good style of doing it, but what style without substance? Amen? Amen? It's only the Holy Spirit that can touch people. And if it's not in you, they might not be touched. <coughs> Amen? Amen? And when you teach and when you minister to others and when you witness, you are going to feel a need for the Spirit. And you're going to be constantly going back for more. Amen? Amen? Now, so that's what's going to happen. And you shall know that I'm in the midst of you. Verse 28. Uh, it says here, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon how many? How many? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters. daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see. This is God's promise. It's both eschatological, it's both apocalyptic because it's not dependent on human response. God is going to pour out his spirit on someone. But it's also classical because it's dependent. You getting it depends on your response. Amen. Now, and he goes on to say, uh, uh, verse 29, and also upon my servant and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. I'm going to pour it on everyone. Now notice verse 30, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood, fire, pillars of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness. Now notice this is going to be an amazing time. Amen. Let me tell you something. You are sitting there and you're talking to people and things are happening that you're talking about. God is backing what you're saying. Right. This is what he did in the 1844, right? William Miller is sitting here preaching his heart out, and then the stars fall. Mm. Let me tell you something. The churches will fill the next day. Amen? Mm -hmm. God is going to do something greater in these last days. Mm. People are going to look at you. The Bible... We've got to do this. Amen. Now notice this, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. Let me tell you something. This is something that God is going to do singularly for his Advent people. This is not happening anywhere else. And in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, I'm going to share with you just more, two more things and we're going to close. But I want, I want us to go to... Um, uh, Isaiah chapter 31. Go there with me. Isaiah 31. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, a verse there, but I want to show you that. Isaiah 31 and verse 15. Are we there? Okay. Isaiah 31, uh, 32 rather. 32 verse 15. Are we there? 32 verse 15. Say amen when you're there. Amen. What's the first word? Until. Okay, until the what? Spirit. The Spirit be poured upon us from where? Uh -huh. On high. And the wilderness be what? A fruit fulfilled, and the fruit fulfilled be counted for a what? Forest. For a forest. Wow, 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 wow. Notice what the servant of the Lord has to say here. 
If the wilderness of the church, what wilderness? If the wilderness of the church is to become a fruitful field, this is a direct, direct uh, 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 commentary on this verse. And the fruitful field to be as a forest, it is through the Holy Spirit of God poured out on his people. Amen. So the condition of Joel chapter 2 will be changed by the Holy Spirit upon his people. Now notice this. Heavenly messengers, agencies, have long been waiting for human agents, the members of the church, to cooperate with them in the great work to be done. Let all who believe the truth for this time put away their differences. Put away the what? Differences. Put away their envy. Envy. Put away their evil speaking. Evil speaking. And their evil thinking. Evil thinking. These things we must put away, people. We gotta put this away. When the when when the servant and the Bible says put away, it means you have the power to do that. Amen. Don't just sit there. Well, I can't do it. You know, I'm just gonna wait for God to do it. No, just do it. Pray if you've never prayed and then do it. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Now, uh, I want to end with chapter 52. Go there with me. Chapter 52. Now, in chapter 52 here, what's the first word? Awake. 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 When a person is told to awake, what are they doing? Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> they're sleeping, right? Come on, man. Okay, you're, they're sleeping. Now we understand that Larry is asleep, okay? Awake, awake. Put on your strength. Strength, all who? Zion. Zion, and all the, and thy beautiful Garden. garments, all what? Jerusalem. The holy city. For from here on out, there shall be no more, there shall no come, more come to you un, unto thee, the uncircumcised and the Unclean. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Uncircumcised, we know that that is a reference in the Old Testament to people that were not Jews. But we're no longer talking about Jewish people. We're talking about people who are uncircumcised in heart today. In heart, that's right. Okay? Unconsecrated to God. We've got to be converted. We've got to be fully consecrated to God. Let me tell you something. Malachi says that there's coming a time where you're going to be able to tell that person is not a Christian and that person is a Christian. That's what he says in chapter 2, go here. Then shall you dis return and discern the difference between him who serves God and him who doesn't serve God. Do you want to be standing out there and earmarked clearly that you, you haven't been following God and been a hypocrite all this time? I don't want that. Amen? Amen. Now notice here, it says here, shake yourself from the dust and arise and sit down. Now, those of you who study the Old Testament, when people are in the dust, what are they doing? Morning. 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 That's right. So, awake, awake. Shake yourself from the dust. The Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will do what? Yes, you we have to be humble before He can lift us up. Prayers have to be answered. Pray before they can be answered. Amen? Amen. How is it that God is going to say to an, a person who's not praying, arise from the dust? When you, you don't know nothing about humbling yourself in mourning. Amen? Is this making any kind of sense to anyone? Amen. Right. When we shall have done this. Now notice this. We came from a place where we talked about the dark ages and what happened and all of that and what the church looks like today, today or this year. And what God is calling upon us to do, to pray. When we pray, the fruitful field becomes a forest because we're praying, because the Holy Spirit is poured out. The wheat, the wheat and the barley, these are just symbolic languages for just, you know, a, a revival taking place in the church. A revival of primitive godliness that has never been seen in this generation. When this happens, verse 7 and 8 will be fulfilled. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth what? Good tidings. Good tidings. That publisheth what? Peace. Peace. That bringeth good tidings of good. That publisheth salvation that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together. They shall sing. Notice this. For they shall see how? I to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Not that be a good, beautiful time for us to see eye to eye? Oh, man, our general conference sessions will be different then. Oh, yeah. 
We are going to gather there to talk about how we can reach the world. Amen. What is Amen. working? What's not working? Who needs to go where? And all of that and everything. Now, I'm not going to be there and say, wait a minute, what is my position? What happened to it? I'm not going to be concerned about that. And if I don't want to be concerned about that, then I don't want to be concerned right. about it now. That's right. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter. It should be all right. Amen. Yeah. If you decide that next week you want me to serve here, or you want me to do something, I'm going to do whatever it is that the church decides. I don't care about those kind of things. Amen. 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 That God, Christ is about to come. I'm going to close with these words from a book of prophets and kings. Listen to this. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon the final conflict. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. She is to go forth conquering and to conquer. Amen. Remember that first most period? That was nothing compared to what's going to happen now. What made it that way was the Holy Spirit for the Pentecost. Mm. But we just learned that it was only moderate. And yet the Bible says they went conquering and to conquer. Mm. Let me tell you something. The work that the church is about to do in this world has never been equal anywhere. It has never been seen anywhere. And when the Holy Spirit is poured out, let me tell you something, there will be no fearful, timid people. Yes, right. It's going to seem like you're out of your mind. The Bible, the book of Revelation says, it will be like you are seeking for death and you will not find it. You told me the story, you know, we were listening to Pastor Powell, I hope somebody else has listened to him. I'm addicted to him now, I'm listening to a lot of stuff that he's saying. But you know what, when he said, when they told him, when he says, I can't work, they said, look at this boy. Really, what's up? going to prison. He goes home and prays and he shows up in a communist country and he says, well, I'm ready to go to prison. It's like you're looking for trouble. Yeah. You're looking for prison, but prison is running away from you. Because then God does a miracle, doesn't he? Amen. The huge miracle. What? I read about the miracle. I'm like, wow, you know, this guy's in here and the boss is threatening him. He's in a communist state. He's like, no, there's no way. Now, with the preposition you just made, you, one way or the other, you're going to prison. You just, I don't know what you were thinking, but you are going to prison anyway because it's not possible. So he calls someone up and he says, there's, there's panes of glass, like several tons of glass. Sitting out there, and he's been told to transfer. He says, I'm going to transfer them. And the whole office, including his boss, everybody comes out because they know that it's not going to happen. And so he's got someone with a crane, tons of glass, all stuck together. And they start lifting him up with a crane. And as they're lifting him up, the hooks, the wood that is clipped onto them breaks. Up in the air, this is a crane. And the glass comes down. And then in midair stops. And they're sitting there. The crane guy looks at it and starts trembling. His knees are knocking. Everybody sees what's going on. Glass in the air. And the crane, you know, the chain is going like this. But the glass, several tons, standing in the air. And the whole office is looking. His boss is like, what just happened? And the guy says to him, you know, the crane guy says, what am I supposed to do? And Pablo is sitting there himself. He's just trembling. Everybody's, there's, without exception, everyone's trembling. Okay. And he looks at me and says, I don't know. Well, you know, uh, why don't we just try bringing it down? He says, what do you mean bring it down? The glass is down there, the crane is up here. He says, well, you just, just bring it down. What else can we do? So he starts bringing the chain and the, the, the clips that had it. And when he comes in, you know, the box that was holding them slips over the glass. And when it clips, everything starts going down, including glass, all the way down. Mm -hmm. And sets it down. When he was done, the boss says, okay, look, just get out of here. Go. I don't want you to work. Don't curse my family. Just get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> the pastor shares, it, 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 you know, it's very infectious in the way that he talks. And he says, I, he, he's again to ask God, why would you do that for me? Mm -hmm. Dr. says, I didn't do that for you. Mm -hmm. You just prayed today and said, glorify yourself, not me. I'm not glorifying you. I'm glorifying myself. I wanted them to know Amen. I'm gone. Amen. When we get to the place where we don't care too much about ourselves, our prayers are not about ourselves, God glorify yourself. We'll begin to see miracles like that happen. 
if they saw them in the first church when they were conquering and to conquer, do you think there are going to be some dead people coming to life? What, what, what that man experienced over there is just a foretaste of what is God is about to do. Amen? Amen. What? And it is not just limited to the ministers. There's going to be Phillips in the church. There's going to be Stevens in the church doing all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I am inviting us to be serious about the way that we pray and we regard prayer. Amen. Especially the prayer for the Holy Spirit. Does it make sense to anyone? Amen. I went for a whole hour. That was not my whole my plan. But I prayed that. And I Amen. hope that you were you were blessed. Amen. Um, Amen. Can we sing a song of some sort? Yeah. What can we say? You know the song?